Hello and welcome to today's video. Today we're going to talk about eigenvectors and eigenvalues. So this is section 11.3 eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Let's briefly review the question that we had last time. You do remember, hopefully, that we were trying to solve a system of um, linear differential equations. Um, and the aim was to decouple that system. We found a way to do that by diagonalizing the associated matrix. Um, and for that, we needed a transformation that had just the right properties. Now the question here is, how can we find such a transformation and when does it exist? So in other words, for a given matrix, can we find a basis transformation for that matrix such that transform matrix with respect to the new basis is diagonal and when is this possible? So for a given matrix A in R n to the n. So it needs to be a square matrix. How can we find a basis transformation and an associated transformation matrix S that is then also an n by n square matrix such that S to the minus 1 times A times S is D is a diagonal matrix and second part of the question when is this possible Okay, so let's investigate that question a little. What we want is, we want S to the minus one times A times S be a diagonal matrix D. So we want that to be of the form lambda one to lambda N on the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. S is an invertible matrix, obviously, so we can multiply by S on both sides. That means that is equivalent to AS being equal to SD. And if we denote the columns of S by V1, V2, and so on up to Vn, so these are columns of S, then what that means is A times these columns here is the same as the columns times the diagonal matrix with diagonal lambda 1 to lambda n. Now for the left hand side um, the result A times this matrix S is basically the matrix that consists of the columns A times V1, A times V2, and so on. So what we get is A times V1 for the first column, A times V2 for the second column, and so on, up to A times Vn. And for the right-hand side, 
this um, v1 to vn times the lambdas. Well, what that means is basically um, we multiply each of the columns of that of that S matrix with one of the lambdas. So the result on the right hand side is first column of the result matrix is lambda 1 v1, second column is lambda 2 v2 and so on up to lambda n vn. So what we get here is a couple of equations of that same form. Meaning what we are actually looking for um, is a couple of lambdas and v's that have just this property. And these vectors and values turn out to be so important that they deserve their own name. So let's give that a definition. Definition. Let A be a matrix in R to the n times n, a number lambda in R is then called an eigenvalue of A. if there exists a vector v and um, we don't want v to be the zero vector so we exclude that one specifically such that this precise property holds a times v equals lambda v so the effect that a has on the vector v is um, it's scaling the vector v by a factor of lambda. Uh, and such a vector v also gets a name that is consequently called an eigenvector. Okay? Any such vector v that is not the zero vector is called an eigenvector of A for the eigenvalue lambda. So the question that we have to ask is, is there a basis of R to the N that consists of eigenvectors? of our matrix. If that is the case, then we can use this basis as the columns of our transformation matrix. And then, and only then, a transformation like the one we want actually exists. Okay, so what that means is we can reformulate our question. Question reformulation for a given matrix A is there a basis of R to the N that consists of eigenvectors of A. And second part, how do we determine it? So let's have a quick look at how we could determine eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Determination of eigenvalues 
and eigenvectors. So this is how we do that. Okay, so remember lambda is eigenvalue of A if there is a vector V that is not the zero vector with AV equals lambda V. Let's reformulate that slightly. That is equivalent to a v minus lambda v equals the zero vector. And can I reformulate that a little more? That is equivalent to a minus the identity matrix times lambda times v is the zero vector. That means V is a solution of the equation system A minus lambda EN equals zero. And that is the case if and only if V is contained in the kernel of A minus lambda EN. When does a matrix have a non-trivial kernel? So the, the, the vector V needs to be non-zero. That means we need a non-trivial kernel. Well, that's the case if and only if A minus lambda EN is not invertible. And we have a nice criterion for invertibility namely we can use the determinant. So determinant of A minus lambda EN has to be zero in order for that expression to not be invertible. So an eigenvector exists if and only if the kernel of A minus lambda EN is non-trivial and that means the determinant of A minus lambda EN is zero. And the determinant is something that we can compute. So that gives us uh, a way to actually determine eigenvalues. And because this expression here, this determinant is so important for uh, eigenvalue theory, again it gets is its own name, so there's another definition. So this expression is called the characteristic polynomial of the matrix A. Okay, let's define that one. Um, oops, sorry. For a matrix A in R to the n times n, the characteristic polynomial Um, and it's written as PA of lambda is defined as PA of lambda is the determinant of A minus lambda EN. And uh, also the uh, the kernel that we need um, that represents the possible eigenvalues uh, eigenvectors sorry also the kernel that we need that uh, represents the possible eigenvectors gets its own name that is called the eigenspace. So the kernel. Cur a minus lambda en is called the eigenspace of A for the eigenvalue lambda.
and written as well as different ways to write this um, what I will use is the expression Ike right Ike a of lambda that is the kernel of a minus lambda en so that is the eigenspace. Um, the eigenspace is the set of possible eigenvectors for an eigenvalue lambda, but it also includes the zero vector. Remember, the zero vector can never be an eigenvector, but it is included in the eigenspace. Um, the reason for this is we want the eigenspace to be um, a vector space, and of course that has to include the zero vector, yeah, just for convenience. So. Just as a remark, let's write this down. So I A of lambda is a vector space. It contains the vector zero. But please remember, and that is important, the zero vector can never be an eigenvector. Just in case you wonder why we exclude that in the definition, that's simply because A times the zero vector is, well, always zero. So whatever lambda we put there would work for the definition of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Yeah. So if we did that, then every possible value of lambda would be an eigenvalue. And that's pretty boring. Okay, so now we got everything that we need, um, pretty much to determine eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Um, let's sum this up. So summary computation of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. How can we do that? Well, first, for a given matrix, we determine the characteristic polynomial. So determine the characteristic polynomial PA of lambda by computing the determinant of A minus lambda EN. Then second, um, determine the roots of that polynomial. All these roots are eigenvalues of A. or roots of P A lambda are eigenvalues of A. And of course, zero may occur here. So zero is totally fine um, for an eigenvalue, just not as an eigenvector. And part three, for each eigenvalue, Lambda determine the corresponding eigenspace, like A of lambda, by solving the linear equation system A minus lambda en times v equals the zero vector. So we determine the corresponding kernel. And that's how you compute eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Now the next question to ask is of course, um, under which conditions does this actually give us a basis of our n as we want it to? So that's what we are going to talk about in one of the next videos. 
Um, but before we do that, we need to deal with uh, a little technicality. And that is, this uh, characteristic polynomial may well not have any real roots. So, can we say something about that case? If the polynomial doesn't have any real roots, what does that say and how, how can we proceed in that case? That is what we're going to deal with next. Um, by expanding our number system a little, so we are removing from the reals to the so-called complex numbers, and that's going to be the topic of the next video.